Peridelkino, the home of Boris Pasternak. After the war, he returned to work on a novel critical of the communist revolution. It was called Dr. Zhivago. When it was published in 1957, he was attacked by Pravda as a self-infatuated Narcissus, a weed on Soviet soil. Boris Pasternak was not alone in being persecuted. A monkey escapes from the zoo here and spends a day sampling the joys of Soviet life. At the end of the day, he decides he'd rather be back at the zoo. For writing that story, satirist Mikhail Zoschenko was officially charged with rotten nihilism. The romantic poet Anna Akhmatova was expelled from the writer's union, accused of being a cross between a nun and a whore. The great composers Shostakovich and Prokofiev were condemned for not writing tunes that could be whistled by every worker. Pasternak's hero, Dr. Zhivago, says a grown man must grit his teeth and share his country's destiny. In the post-war world, that is what the Soviet people had to do. former capital of Lithuania, which has been successively occupied by Poland, Russia, and Germany, has been virtually destroyed four times by war, which has periodically swept over it in its turbulent history. As the war ended, the Red Army liberated millions of people from German occupation. In official newsreels, they welcomed the Red Army, but most waited to see what would happen. In the fields and forests of Lithuania, partisans had been fighting a guerrilla war against the Germans. Now they turned to face a new enemy, the occupying Red Army. Kazimiera Varkalete was one of those determined to fight on. The Russians arrived. We'd already heard about their government. They'd done terrible things. There was nothing good about them. Our men didn't want to join their army. We wanted to fight for Lithuania, not for the Russians. So our men went into the forest. They set up a resistance group. My brother and a friend hid away here. I brought them a machine gun I'd found. They repaired it and began to set themselves up as the Iron Wolf group. Josas Skarzinskas joined the Freedom Fighters. They called themselves the Brothers of the Forest. We came down this crisscross path. As we got closer, we could see that the soil was soft, so we picked a spot just here. This is where my friends and I started to dig our bunker, a secret bunker. It was difficult. We had to dig a deep hole. Then, because we couldn't disguise the earth we dug up, we had to carry it to a spot to hide it. At last, the bunker was ready. We started to live here, to hide away. It was impossible to find us. Clad in motley uniforms, armed with captured or discarded weapons, the partisans played a deadly game of cat and mouse with Soviet security troops. Without the help of their countrymen, the brothers of the forest would not have survived. Kazimiera Varkalete was confronted one day by Soviet troops searching for partisans who were hiding under the barn. <laughs> They started throwing off the logs to try and find the bunker, but I was quietly throwing them back on to cover the air pipe which was now sticking out. Their dogs were sniffing, sniffing, but they didn't smell anything. They started to poke around, clearing away more logs. A few more and they would have found the bunker. 
да, малка смята, не, я у тих тех, как мясо, малку, и я сразу, вет, я, поскольку мало... They noticed I was throwing the logs around and said, if you're hiding bandits here, you'll die with them. No, there aren't any here, I said. Finally they left. I ran and told the partisans what had happened. Did you hear anything? No, they said nothing. We were asleep. You have to stay in the cold, in the wood, drenched. And very often you are surrounded by NKVD and local collaborators. And you have to escape to fight. Sometimes the, you have to fight a group of partisans consists of 12 people. And you face a 400 strong army. The one-sided struggle went on into the 1950s. Sometimes the bodies of dead partisans were laid out in town squares. University lecturer Albinas Kentra has never forgotten the sight. You see young, beautiful boys, and when you pass by, well, you might, you know, it might be your class friends, school friend, it might be your relation, it might be your brother, and you cannot look at for a long time at, you would be arrested. Mothers come and look at their sons, and they cannot show these are the, their sons. They would be arrested. After the war, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia and Moldavia became Soviet republics. Eastern Poland was incorporated into the Ukraine. May Day, 1949. The Red Empire now equaled the Empire of the Tsars. The new Tsar, Joseph Stalin, who had masterminded the victory over Hitler, now called himself Generalissimo, great leader and teacher, father of the nation. His position seemed more secure than ever. I believe that Stalin was the greatest person. Everybody else is just tiny, petty people. Some parents, by the way, told their kids that you should first love and respect Stalin, then your parents. It, it, he is your father. When Marina Young was a schoolgirl, no one ever dared criticize Stalin openly, even within the family. My brother of my mother told me something, not very, uh, you know, positive things about Stalin, by the way. My mother, I remember, was very much afraid and told him, you know, don't say that, you know, you don't know much about this or something, he so told him. But I remember my, I, I hated my uh, uncle, just hated. He seemed like, you know, beast or something. How can you not love Stalin? Uh, was a friend of mine and I was uh, uh, talking to him and he would say to me, you know that Stalin, if he wanted to be a writer, he would write novels better than Sholokhov. And I thought, yes, yes, it's definitely, he's just too busy, he won't do it. But I believe that. Uh, uh, he would be a better uh, surgeon. Uh, he could be eye surgeon as good as Philato, famous eye surgeon at the time. And I believed it. And I was almost ready to cry when I was thinking about Stalin. It was such a uh, strong feeling, the reaction of, the, uh, of feeling uh, that there is a man who is smoking that pipe and who is thinking about us. Uh, Grandfather Stalin, and I remember reading in newspapers that, thank you, Comrade Stalin, for our happy childhood. It was just so strong. The post-war Soviet Union settled into a Stalinist rut. Stalin only liked classical ballet. 
So great companies like the Kirov and the Bolshoi kept to a diet of approved works. Productions rarely changed, and sometimes sets and costumes were worn out by repeated performances. The party, ultimately Stalin, was the arbiter of taste. War memorials had to reflect the party's heroic leading role in the victory over fascism. Artist Tanya Litvinov was married to a sculptor. My husband did lots of portraits. He was very interested in them. But again, they weren't right because they had to be a special angle of the head, you know, heroic, and he did them in a more quiet way. <laughs> we were neighbors with Shostakovich and got friendly, and my husband did his head. But when the head of the arts committee, Hrabchenko, came to accept the portrait, he wouldn't, because he said, it, we want Shostakovich the optimist and my husband showed all his tragic. As a matter of fact, it was the best portrait of Shostakovich and the best portrait my husband ever did. Academic orthodoxy was rigidly enforced. Students had to pass exams on their knowledge of Stalin's short course on the history of the Communist Party. The new enemy was cosmopolitanism infection with decadent bourgeois Western ideas. The campaign reached its height in 1948. A charlatan appeared, promising comrade Stalin a miracle, bountiful harvests to end forever the food shortages that plagued the Soviet economy. Biologist Trofim Lysenko denied the existence of genes and rejected Western theories of heredity. With Stalin as his patron, Lysenko dealt Soviet agriculture and science a blow from which it has never fully recovered. All invention, all great invention in the world uh, should be uh, done uh, by Russians. Uh, for example, radio was invented by uh, Russian Popov, not by uh, Marconi as anybody in the world knew. Uh, and uh, uh, aircraft was invented by Majaisky, but not uh, Brother Wrights as anybody knew. Uh, uh, scientists couldn't uh, refer in their dissertations, in their books on foreign uh, uh, scientists, on foreign researchers, because it was cosmopolitanism. They should refer only uh, to uh, Russian scientists. Uh, it was absolutely crazy situation in culture and in science. But some Western ideas were not unwelcome to Stalin. Soviet atom scientists relied on Western defectors and spies for the data they needed to build an atomic bomb. August the 22nd, 1949, the Soviet Union broke the American monopoly of nuclear weapons. Stalin now had the power to kill millions of foreigners. He had been killing millions of his own people for years. Nadezhda Sergeyevna Aleluyeva Stalin, Stalin's second wife. There are historians who say that Stalin sometimes came here to the Novodevice Cemetery to sit at the grave of the woman he had driven to suicide. Others say he never did anything of the kind. If historians can't agree about one simple fact, how can they answer the really big questions? Like, did Stalin ever regret what he had done to the Soviet people in whose name he ruled? If he did, he never showed it. 1953 began with the unmasking of yet another plot against the Soviet state. 
Doctors working in the Kremlin hospitals were accused of planning to wipe out the Soviet Union's political bosses, including Stalin. Many of the accused were Jews, and a wave of government-inspired anti-Semitism swept the country. One of those under suspicion was Yakov Rapopor. The secret police came for him. The officer was speaking very calmly, as though he'd come to take me to a sanatorium. He said to my wife, he won't need that or that, sort out a pair of socks, some hankies. He was so calm. Then we went out and down the stairs. The other officer stayed behind to conduct a search here in my flat. As we walked down the stairs, the officer said to me, if we meet anybody, just tell them you're going on a business trip. I almost burst out laughing. Who on earth will believe that in the middle of the night, accompanied by the secret police, I'm going on a business trip? It was so stupid. Officers of the secret police searched the flat and found Dr. Rappaport's heart medicine. His daughter Natalia remembers their reaction. When they saw this skull and crossed bones on the ampulla, it was like an explosion of a bomb. They were so, they got so excited, they decided that they found a poison in the apartment of a killer, of Dr. Killer. They took this ampulla, they put it in a small box, and they put a seal, and then they put this small box into the bigger box, and another seal on it. And the military, the man, person in military uniform, asked my mother, how many people uh, is it possible to kill with one this ampulla, ampule? And my mother answered that nobody can be killed with one ampule of atropine, it is just a medicine. The doctors and their families were reviled as enemies of the people. Already there was a rumor that he took pass from a uh, corpse of people who died from cancer, and he put this pass onto the healthy people in uh, trams, in buses, and uh, in such a way he made these uh, people ill with cancer. Dr. Rapopor was held in the Lubyanka prison. A show trial was being prepared, but a few weeks after his arrest, he was summoned by the commandant. He asked me, how do you feel, Yakov Lvovich? I shouted back at him, well, how do you think a man would feel in my situation? He kept looking at me, pacing up and down his office. The thing is, I've called you in to inform you that your case is now closed. March the 5th, 1953. The supreme leader and teacher father of the nation, Corypheus of science, Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin, was dead. It was a personal tragedy, and we heard it on, on radio that Stalin died, and I was just uh, crying, and I just uh, couldn't believe uh, that it happened, and f I felt orphaned. And there was a meeting uh, at high school where I, uh, I was, and during that meeting, a boy standing next to me smiled, and I started to beat him. Uh, and somebody had to hold me, because I just couldn't believe that you could smile at that day. I remember sitting up all night in front of the window, which looked onto the Kremlin, and thinking, what will happen now? And then suddenly, about four or five in the morning, a brilliant thought crossed my mind that nothing could be worse than it has been. <laughs> and I felt very, very happy. The prisoners of the Gulag rejoiced. 
In the Volkuta mining camps above the Arctic Circle, they refused to go to work. Appeals for support from other camps were scrawled on the side of coal wagons. The unrest spread. The camp administration reacted violently. Somebody gave the command fire. The shooting didn't last long, about three minutes. <coughs> but they were using all sorts of weapons, automatics, rifles, machine guns. They fired straight into the crowd. There were over 2,000 men in the camp. The ones on the front line by the gates were killed straight away. They all still lie here. 62 people died that day, and they're all buried here. Mourners were crushed to death as they queued to pay their last respects to Stalin. For Stalin's closest colleagues in the Politburo, his death was timely. There were signs that the old tyrant had been planning a major purge of the party leadership. The Politburo immediately began the rehabilitation of prisoners. Dr. Rappaport telephoned to say he was coming home. A minute later, it was a sound of lift, and the dog was like Sphinx. He was sitting in front of the door and awaiting for my father to come. And he didn't, uh, she didn't like anybody to come up uh, to the door. She was awaiting. She was the first person in this meeting. And when there was a call in the door, my mother opened the door and the dog jumped from the uh, floor up to the height of the face of my father, like this. And she was crying. Ah, ah, ah. It took time for my mother to come up to my father and to kiss him. It was her turn was the second one and my turn was the third one. When Stalin died, Lavrenti Beria, feared head of the secret police, looked the man most likely to succeed. He alone, among the grey men of the Politburo, seemed strong enough to assume power. But the Politburo feared another reign of terror. The last thing they wanted was someone with Beria's bloody record as head of the party and the state. The great Soviet encyclopedia Repository of Orthodoxy, assuming you're reading the current edition. This is volume five of the second edition. In the summer of 1953, subscribers received an odd letter. It instructed them to cut out, with scissors or razor blade, pages 21 to 24, and replace them with new ones. These new pages contained pictures of the Bering Sea and an article on a hitherto neglected 18th century courtier called Berkholz. The old pages had an article on Beria, who had now, in true Orwellian tradition, become an unperson. Politburo members Nikita Khrushchev and Georgi Malenkov had Beria arrested. He was eventually shot as a British spy. The contest for the leadership was now between these two. Khrushchev came out the winner. The memory of Joseph Stalin still dominated Soviet life. Khrushchev wrote, For three years we were unable to break with the past, unable to muster the courage and the determination to lift the curtain and see what had been hidden from us about the arrests, the trials, the executions and everything else that had happened during Stalin's reign. One evening in February 1956, the Reuters correspondent in Moscow had a visit from an agent of the KGB. He offered John Retty the scoop of the century. 
he arrived in my flat. Uh, we put on loud music, <clears throat> just in case of the microphones, and he then began to tell me this amazing tale uh, of Khrushchev denouncing Stalin as a murderer and a torturer and an absolute devil incarnate. Uh, I didn't know whether to believe him or not. Uh, I had pages of notes that he'd given me out of his head. He had nothing written down, but he was very well briefed. So uh, I phoned my colleague in Reuters, whom I was working at the time, and said, um, I've got to meet you. So uh, we met outside the central telegraph office, uh, and we stayed outside because of the microphones, and uh, we tramped through the snow of Moscow while I recounted this tale to him, pausing under the lamplight to read my notes and crunching on. I suppose we were about two hours outside talking about it, and uh, in the end, we had to decide whether we accepted the story or not. It did fit with the rumors we'd heard in embassies and so on, and uh, this fellow did have some credentials from giving me information before. So we decided we did believe it, and when I would go out to Stockholm the next day, I'd take the notebook burning holes in my pocket on the plane and file it from Stockholm. Gathering in the Kremlin, the 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party springs a surprise on the world. Joseph Stalin, the man who ruled Russia for a quarter of a century, is publicly criticized for the first time. The critics include Premier Bulganin, his predecessor Melenkov, and Party Secretary Khrushchev. Khrushchev and his colleagues tell the delegates that for 20 years the party has suffered in all its work from one man rule. Now, they announce, collective leadership has been restored and wider party democracy is promised. It was Khrushchev who pushed through what came to be known as the secret speech. His son-in-law remembers the reaction. There was dead silence in the hall. At first, everybody was just shocked. After some time, once it had sunk in, you could hear cries of shame, disgraceful. The old communists were crying. People who recognized the names of their relatives and realized their fate wept. At party meetings, the speech was read out. Khrushchev addressed a gathering here in Moscow's Hall of Columns, scene of many of Stalin's show trials. Khrushchev was standing here when he was handed a note which read, how could you, members of the Politburo, allow such grave crimes to be committed in our country? Khrushchev read out the note and glared down the hall. This note is not signed. Stand up the person who wrote it. Nobody moved. The person who wrote this note is frightened, said Khrushchev. Well, we were frightened to stand up against Stalin. Khrushchev, a disciple of Stalin, had finally had the courage to stand up and be counted. The madness was over. Khrushchev set out to dismantle Stalinism. He opened up the Kremlin for parties and shut down the Gulag the slave labor system that had been the backbone of the Soviet economy for nearly three decades. American-born George Green had been imprisoned for spying. During the Khrushchev time, when he decided to let the people out, practically everyone who was not tried officially with, by a court but went through the Osofer term were released. And I was among, among them. Uh, I was given a small slip of paper, about a quarter of a regular sized <laughs> sheet of your notebook, on which said that mm, due to the unnecessity for further detention to be released without having uh, a uh, judgment. And said I could go wherever I wanted. They gave me uh, money for a one-way one -way fare. I said, where do you want to go to Moscow? And they gave me a ticket to Moscow, and I came to Moscow. 
George Green and his wife Helena were among the millions released that summer of 1956. When they arrived in Moscow, they found a desperate housing shortage. People lived in communal flats shared by several families, as another former camp inmate recalls. There were 23 people, six families, and I had a room which was seven square meters. The worst thing was uh, that you have one lavatory, one bathroom, and one kitchen. I mean, if you just can't imagine that everybody before going out wants to go to the lavatory, at the same time, and you have 23 people banging at the door like mad, not only that you can't sit there, but you can't even, you know, collect your thoughts. In communal flat conditions, uh, I don't think one can call it peace and quiet. I remember a mother throwing into her husband, who was the father of the family, a kettle with boiling water, and it somehow landed on him. The father was chasing that poor mother, and I remember she jumped into my room, hiding from him. He was chasing her with an axe. And the children, for example, the young men, probably had girlfriends, but there was no way they could meet, because you haven't got hotels, you haven't got a room on your own. And they lived six people, and they were good-looking young men who could never, ever bring anybody home because there were six people in one room, which is half of where we are now. Khrushchev abandoned Stalin's monumental building plans. Instead, Soviet cities were surrounded by forests of cranes and muddy building sites. Over the next 10 years, the housing stock doubled. The program had a curious side effect. It was the uh, time when uh, company uh, flourished. Uh, it was the time when almost every in evening we gathered in companies, uh, not only to sing, to dance, but to, to speak with each other, to produce our new values. Uh, uh, we needed it strongly and to discuss our past and our future. In the newly constructed flats, the quest for forbidden knowledge spawned a secret industry, the illicit copying and distribution of banned books. It was known as Samizdat. I personally got involved in Samizdat. Uh, we started because I didn't have a typewriter at home and was a bad typist. We would uh, buy a camera and would take a picture of every page of a novel, like Dr. Zhivago, for example, was one of the things, and would uh, take a picture of every page and then would uh, do it with my friend and then would uh, print. Uh, make it, it was very thick paper. So the Dr. Zhivago was uh, several boxes of that paper of this size. And after we, uh, we, we will get a tape, uh, film, and then this film will give it to some other friends in Leningrad who would do the same thing. And then the, we would invite all our friends to some kind of party where everybody would read uh, because uh, somebody else would want to read next night. So we would start passing it around and everybody, somebody will have first page, second page. So there were such, such kind of some is that parties. I remember them, people would not drink vodka, wouldn't do anything. They will drink tea and will just quietly read page after page after page. That was extremely exciting times. Pasternak finished Dr. Zhivago in 1955. Banned in the Soviet Union, it was published in the West in 1957 and became an international bestseller. What happened next showed there were limits to Khrushchev's liberal reforms. In October 1958, Pasternak was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. Olga Ivinskaya was his lover and the model for Lara. His first reaction was one of humility, pride and joy. He sent a telegram to that effect to the Swedish Academy. But then, outside pressure built up to such an extent that in the end, he was forced to turn the prize down. They ran a campaign against him. His books were taken off the printing presses. A selected edition of his poems, about to come out, was stopped. All the publishing houses ripped up his contracts and sent them back. 
It began to affect me, too, and Boris, unable to get any work anywhere, was driven to despair. There is no way out for me. How dare I write such stuff? I, scoundrel and evildoer, who made the whole world weep at the beauty of my native land. Khrushchev did a brave thing when he denounced Stalin. But the de-Stalinization policy was not a simple matter of liberal conscience. Khrushchev used it blatantly to impose his will on the rest of the party hierarchy. The little man of the people, in his baggy trousers, seemed to be firmly in charge. He put his supporters, like wartime comrade Leonid Brezhnev, into the Politburo. The Stalinist old guard were in retreat. They mounted one last effort to overthrow Khrushchev, but it failed. Fearing the worst, one of the plotters telephoned the Kremlin to plead for his life. Khrushchev told him, you measure others by your own yardstick. You will be able to live in peace if you work honestly, like all Soviet people. He kept his word. The bloodletting had stopped. Young people were inspired by Khrushchev's denunciation of Stalin. They decided it was time to join the party. It provided a much needed transfusion of new blood. Khrushchev mobilized their enthusiasm for a crusade to tackle the chronic food shortages. As so often with his plans, it was supposed to offer an instant solution. He looked to the east, to the so-called virgin lands of Kazakhstan and Western Siberia. Khrushchev called on young communists to help turn the step into the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. Politburo member Leonid Brezhnev was put in charge. were excellent. Khrushchev appeared to have overcome a problem that had plagued the Soviet Union since its creation. But the virgin lands were not as empty as they looked. The Kazakhs, persecuted and collectivized by Stalin 30 years earlier, once again stood in the way of Moscow's imperial plans. They took our horses away from us, and we couldn't live without them, without the meat, without their milk, but they didn't listen. They wouldn't let us breed anything, not a single cow or horse. Their only aim was to grow corn, which was no good for us at all. So you see, he didn't do any good for Kazakhstan. Khrushchev bubbled with new ideas, picked up and discarded with bewildering speed. His speeches were peppered with exhortations to plant maize, Chinese millet, melons and other crops in areas where they won't grow properly. Later his enemies were to call this harebrained scheming, but Khrushchev simply couldn't help interfering. The managers of collective farms were bombarded with a bewildering barrage of directives issuing from the Kremlin. Stepan Olyenik was chairman of a collective farm in the Ukraine. Our main crops had always been wheat and sugar beet, but he wanted maize. Maize and China millet and Russian dandelion. Basically, he'd chosen everything you can't grow here. 
We ended up with no bread. We had to eat cornbread. And then they started rationing even that, because everybody had sown maize, but it wouldn't ripen as they'd sowed the wrong sort. In the end, we had no food at all. There was this Chinese stuff we didn't know how to grow, and then there was Russian dandelion, which you need a very warm climate for, so that didn't work either. Then they decided to destroy our grass crops. Orders came, no sowing of any grass crops. The whole thing was hopeless, and we didn't have any say in what was going on. Khrushchev reorganized education too. As part of their course, students had to work in factories or on collective farms for at least three days a week. Some got more of an education than the authorities bargained for. The authorities obviously did not realize what they're doing because we did get a certain sense what the life is about in the Soviet Union. For example, one of the things which puzzled us greatly is that the whole uh, workforce in that factory was drunk by midday. And we, as the younger fellows around, were quite often sent off to, to buy vodka. Uh, the second thing which was puzzling, that uh, whatever could be stolen from that factory by the workers always got f stolen, including sometimes quite valuable things. Uh, but the biggest uh, surprise for me was uh, that they actually didn't produce anything. Uh, even if uh, uh, a, a foreman uh, gave an order to a worker to produce a certain amount of nuts and bolts. Instead of producing them, he would secretly go around to a storage of the ready-made product, where behind of it, a couple of boards were already loosened by many others, would uh, sneak into that, find the, uh, uh, the appropriate bolts and not nuts, steal them, and bring them back to his foreman, saying that he just manufactured them. So that was the first uh, sense, the first uh, feeling that this vast country with all these quotas and socialist competitions and all the hullabaloo doesn't produce anything. In October 1957, the Soviet Union astonished the world by being the first to put a man-made object into space. A tiny satellite called Sputnik was successfully placed in an orbit 200 miles above the Earth. Everyone soon knew its call sign. I was never bombarded with so much propaganda as the morning when I got up and heard the news about the first Sputnik. Everywhere in the capital, every street, they had these banners in the shop saying, we are first in the world. We have surpassed America. Robert Robinson had been living in the Soviet Union for almost 30 years, but when it came to Sputnik, he was still a foreigner. Just come to you and say, have you seen my, the Sputnik? We have surpassed America. How you like it? Or they would see me about passing me. They would say, beep, 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 beep. Just like the Sputnik was, you know, passed whenever you, you, you heard, beep, beep, to call my attention. The Soviet Union maintained its lead in space. In 1958, a dog called Laika was sent into orbit. Unable to return to Earth, she became the first martyr of the Soviet space program.
When the scientists first showed us one of the rockets, we thought it looked like nothing but a huge cigar-shaped tube, and we didn't believe it would fly, wrote Khrushchev. We were like peasants in the marketplace. We walked around the rocket, touching it, tapping it to see if it was sturdy enough. We did everything but lick it to see how it tasted. achievement came on April the 12th, 1961. The first cosmonaut, Yuri Gagarin, lifted off from the Soviet Space Center in Central Asia. During his 108-minute orbit of the Earth, he delivered revolutionary greetings to the countries below. A hero of socialist labor in the 1930s remembers the space hero of the 60s. When our darling Yuri Gagarin walked into our lives, he seemed so extraordinary. What he did was an achievement for everybody. You see, Yuri always said that his flight was not just down to him personally, but so many people had worked to make it a success. He was so grateful. I can't explain how we felt. There were crowds all over Red Square. Everybody was shouting, our Yuri in space, our Yuri, who will be next? It was such a triumph. We were so incredibly happy, as, as though you'd made the flight, as though I had. It was a joy we all felt. Khrushchev basked in the reflected glory of Gagarin's flight. Eventually, Khrushchev's successors would have him erased from the photographs of the occasion. But all that was in the future. At the 22nd Party Congress in the summer of 1961, a young Mikhail Gorbachev, attending his first gathering, heard a confident Khrushchev applaud the achievements of the party. The new party program proclaimed that socialism had been achieved. Communism would arrive within 20 years. But there was one last piece of unfinished business. At the 22nd Party Congress, a woman delegate, a veteran of the revolution and former inmate of a labor camp, made an extraordinary speech. She concluded, and I quote from the party record, I always hold Vladimir Ilyich Lenin in my heart. And always, comrades, at my worst moments, I only survived because Ilyich was in my heart and I could consult him. Loud applause. Yesterday I consulted Ilyich as though he stood alive in front of me, and he said, it is unpleasant for me to be in the mausoleum next to Stalin, who brought so much grief to the party. Loud, prolonged applause. That very night, Stalin's body was removed from the mausoleum. His name was erased from the maps. <laughs> 